I work at Ipswich Hospital in the surrounding rural areas and I have been a respiratory nurse since about 1995. Um, so it's nice to be able to present Little Lungs, which they've um, redone slightly this year. So um, I hope you enjoy it and please ask questions um, by sticking your little questions in the um, question box at the bottom. And we'll try and so, um, we're going to cover the Australian Asthma Handbook, which is the guidelines for um, asthma in Australia. That's the guidelines we use in general practice and in hospital care. A um, bit of asthma pathophysiology, but not much. Uh, triggers, um, diagnostic principles in children, management principles in children. So how do we manage asthma in children? Uh, as asthma action plans in kids and um, acute medical management for children in primary care. And there's a little bit at the end about asthma and COVID guidelines. So we're hoping you'll um, be able to identify the steps for um, looking after people, diagnosing people, uh, children with asthma and being able to um, look at the asthma action plans and how you fill them out. Uh, and looking at the steps for acute asthma in primary care. So this is what the asthma uh, handbook looks like if you Google it and stick National Asthma Council, Asthma Australia, um, asthma handbook in your Google search. So this is what it'll come up with. And you can search all sorts on here. Um, it's all um, easy to find. So just put in your say pediatric asthma uh, diagnosis and it will pop up. It's really easy to find, so have a play with that after. So the facts um, about children and asthma is one of the most common childhood conditions. Um, so you, you'll see a lot of presentations in primary care and emergency departments and a lot of admissions to hospital for children with asthma. So 20 to 25% of hospital admissions for asthma occur in February. Um, I usually ask why, but it'll take a while for the questions or the answers to come through. So you could probably guess why that's when the schools go back and the viruses start running rampant around the schools and viruses can trigger off asthma. Um, it's more prevalent in boys in age zero to 14, but then when puberty hits, it's um, uh, more prevalent in girls and that's basically lifelong after that. Um, not all children with a wheeze have asthma. So two out of three children with a recurrent wheeze aged one to five don't really have asthma by the time they're six. They're just wheezy kids. Um, and about 21% of children um, aged one to 12 have reported disturbed sleep from asthma over the previous month. So it's still not being very well um, looked after. So just remember Asthma is a chronic lung disease. It can be controlled, but we can't cure it. And it's defined by the, both the presence of excessive variation in lung function and variable respiratory symptoms. So lung function, we're talking about spirometry, and um, we'll go into who can do that at what age. Um, and kids who are, um, they'll be wheezy one day and then fine for a few weeks and then wheezy again. So it's not all the time. Narrowing of the airway, so it's not just due to the bron bronchial constriction like we used to think, it's a lot of inflammation in the lining of the airway and the bronchial constriction of the smooth muscles um, on the outside of the airway walls. And you also get an increase in mucus production. So when you ask an asthmatic um, what their mucus is like, it's usually like sticky, clear stuff like wallpaper paste. So a nice diagram to show you a normal airway on your left and then uh, uh, somebody having an asthma attack on your right. So you can see the lining of the airway in a normal airway is quite um, open. There's no restriction in the air going in and out and the muscles are relaxed. Um, when you're having an asthma attack, the muscles are really tight, but you also get this inflammation or redness and swelling on the inside of the airway and produce more mucus. So you produce more mucus, uh, goblet cells, which produce more mucus. So triggers in asthma, there's lots of triggers that can um, make asthma worse. And they don't have to happen. They, you can have a trigger and they might not get the symptoms till later on that night. So common triggers, 
respiratory infections like common cold. At the moment, RSV is going around like wildfire. I don't know about down in Sydney, but up here in Brisbane, we've got a lot of patients in the hospital with RSV. Um, exposure to cigarette smoke. So you're hoping your kids aren't smoking, but we do get patients in that smoke, started smoking age seven, so you never know. Um, but obviously parental smoking, e-cigarettes and water pipes. Um, if they're um, smoking e-cigarettes in the house, I don't know if you've seen anybody smoking an e-cigarette and all these fumes of vapour coming out. It's obviously not good for your lungs. Weather conditions, so cold air, um, temp temperature changes. I always used to think it was hilarious in Brisbane that people said that their asthma was um, triggered by the cold. And it, I'm like, oh, I'm Scottish and uh, this is not cold, but there is a massive difference in the summer, um, in the winter between the temperature during the day and the temperature at night. So it might be like 25 degrees till four o'clock or five o'clock and then it drops to zero. So that's a huge rapid temperature change that it, their airways um, are a bit twitchy and that, that'll trigger off asthma. Um, so other allergens or so like animals, cats are the worst uh, animals. So it's their saliva that, um, when they lick themselves all over, uh, dogs, any animals with fur really. Um, and even bald cats can be an issue because they still lick themselves and it's not the fur they are you're allergic to, it's their saliva. Pollens, molds, uh, outdoor air pollution, um, there's all sorts of things, um, cockroach poo, house dust mites. Um, exercise is another one. So when you're looking at children and you want to see if they've got asthma, children zero to 12 months, it's very difficult with a little baby. Um, and you shouldn't really label a baby with asthma um, because it's very difficult to actually diagnose in that age group. Um, and it's usually the wheezing's usually caused by an acute viral bronchiolitis rather than um, asthma or like small and floppy airways. Their airways haven't formed properly yet. Um, a paediatric respiratory physician or paediatrician um, could help with the diagnosis and they really should be um, referred if you're going to start short acting beta agonists or give them steroids or inhaled steroids to an under 12 month, uh, 12 month old. So with children and um, one to five years, it's still quite difficult. Um, as I said before, many preschoolers, they wheeze, but they, um, usually it's just due to a viral infection and not due to asthma. But you can have a look at the diagnosis um, based on like their history. So family history. So we're talking about mum, dad, brothers, sisters, not great aunt Betty and, um, you know, just the immediate family. Um, if they've got a history of asthma, um, then they, they might be more likely to have asthma. Um, if there's a personal history, so the, the child's got eczema or allergic rhinitis, um, and the picture on the right shows a little kid um, wiping their nose like this. Um, that's usually a sign that they've got rhinitis, they've got hay fever, and their nose is itchy or running, and they're constantly wiping their nose. I know my little boy, when he had, um, he had asthma as a little child, and when he was a baby, he used to wipe his face like that, or wipe it on the carpet. He'd wipe his face on the carpet, so he had a big red streak across here, but quite often it's a a red nose across here where they're wiping it constantly. So looking for that. Um, if mum smoked during pregnancy, they're more likely to have a bit of asthma. Um, the previous wheezing episodes or noisy breathing. Um, and you can look at the timing of these previous episodes. So if they um, get wheezy every time they go to granny's and granny's got a cat or um, every time they um, go somewhere that there's a possible allergen or somebody cuts the grass. Um, you can have a think about that, you know, take a good history. Um, I have a physical examination. So you're going to have a look at their chest size and how they breathe. Signs of rhinitis, as I said before, um, looking at them doing this all the time. Um, have a look at their breathing. I'm going to have a listen to their lungs and listen for a wheeze. 
it's not diagnostic of asthma because as I said before, you can have a wheeze with um, viral bronchiolitis. Shape of the chest. Um, in some kids, um, because we can't do spirometry in this age group, we could do a treatment trial and see if they um, get better with inhaled bronchodilators or preventers. But that would only be a, a very low dose of preventer. So management of these children, once we have actually diagnosed the asthma, um, you manage the symptoms with um, a reliever, which would be Ventolin or Bricodil, um, during the wheezy episodes. Um, a small proportion, only a little proportion, need a regular preventer for symptoms. Um, they'd have to have the symptoms at least four to six weekly, so every month they're having um, symptoms of asthma. And that should be you looking at whether it disrupts their their play playing activities or their sleep. Uh, in those children, you would start a low dose inhaled corticosteroid or Montelukast, which is Singulair. Um, that's the treatment for this age group. So um, they very rarely require um, an inhaled corticosteroid in la uh, LABA, which is like serotide or. Uh, Symbicor, you wouldn't give that to a child of this age group unless their paediatrician has actually recommended it. All parents should have a written as asthma action plan so they know, to, know what to do if their child is sick. Um, puffer and spacer um, is recommended first line choice of device. So up to the age of about one, one and a half um, with a mask. And as soon as you can get them off the mask, because when you breathe with the mask, you tend to nose breathe and your nose will filter out the drugs. So we tend to try and get the little children off the mask as much as possible and just use the mouthpiece on the um, spacer if we can. So usually what I do is ask if they can suck a straw when they go to McDonald's, can they suck a straw, have their Coke through a straw? Then if they can do that, then they can use a spacer without a mask. So it just takes a bit of practice. So with children six years and over, it gets a bit more um, complicated, but easier because you can do some actual diagnostic testing. So you're going to base your diagnosis on a history. So the same as before, looking at family history, a history of eczema and rhinitis. I'm going to do a physical examination um, and diagnostic testing is spirometry and you might do a treatment trial. So this little um, diagram on your right um, goes through um, how to diagnose asthma in a six-year-old or over. So if you've got episodic respiratory symptoms that might suggest asthma, um, do your history and your physical examination, you still think it's asthma. Is the child able to do spirometry? If the answer is yes, you're looking for reversible airflow um, obstruction with an FEV1 um, greater than or equal to 12% from baseline. So you're looking for it to increase by 12%. And then you definitely got asthma, then start the treatment as per the guidelines. If you're not able to do um, spirometry, um, we could do a trial of uh, an inhaler, Ventolin a reliever or, and or a preventer. So all kids need a reliever, but you could add in a preventer as well. Um, and you might get a, diagno a provisional diagnosis of asthma in a child of six years and over that way. Um, if they don't respond to the treatment, um, your asthma is not con confirmed, so you might need to think about referring on at that stage. Obviously, if at the start the history doesn't sound like asthma, then have a think about what else it could be. Um, or if the spirometry is not diagnostic of asthma, um, it says here, consider um, sending them for cardiopulmonary testing um, or a bronchial challenge. I'm not sure what labs do um, that in a child. Um, ours would take them as a teenager, but not as a child. Um, but I'm not sure if the paediatric hospitals might be able to do that for you. So a provisional diagnosis diagnosis of asthma can be made if the child has wheezing accompanied by breathing difficulty or cough. Other features that increase the probability of asthma, such as allergic rhinitis, 
atopic de dermatitis or strong family history of asthma and allergies. No sign that suggests an alternative diagnosis. Um, and they um, feel better or it, you can see demonstrated um, reversibility on spirometry if the child's able to perform that. So age six, seven, you could do spirometry from. Um, the first time they do it, it's usually rubbish. Um, need to practice with them. I send them home with a little cardboard tube and get them to practice how to do spirometry. Okay, the management of these children. So all school age children with asthma need a reliever to use when they have asthma symptoms. And there shouldn't be any kids without a reliever. Um, regular preventer is only indicated for those who have symptoms at least four to six weekly and it disrupts their sleep or their play. So if they're having two asthma exacerbations a year, they wouldn't fall into that regular preventer treatment category. And the dose is determined by risk and severity of flare-ups. So um, obviously, if when they're having their flare-ups, they end up in the hospital all the time, they might have a higher, slightly higher dose than a child who just needs um, more Ventolin or uh, a couple of days of ready bread. And they need regular um, reviews to assess control, which we'll go through in a minute, the control in a minute. Um, treatment might need to be stepped up to add on um, therapy. So you might need them on uh, an ICS and a um, reliever. And then you might add in uh, Montelukast, which is the tablet, Singular, or very occasionally have the combination therapy, but that would be the low dose combination therapy. And over six, you can give Teotropium, which is Spireva, to um, kids with moderate to severe asthma. So this is a bit of a busy slide, but at the bottom you can see the big blue one that says many children um, as needed reliever only. So the vast majority of kids with asthma are in that big blue blob at the bottom and only need a short acting beta agonist like Ventolin. Um, some children need a regular preventer with the reliever, so an ICS, um, a low dose ICS, so um, flexatide low dose, um, or Montelukast, okay? Um, if they're not getting good control, a few children might need a slightly higher dose, uh, the pediatric dose. Uh, of ICS, or they might have a low dose of ICS with lava, so very low dose of serotide. So we're not talking the 250, 25, two puffs PD, that would be a big dose for an adult, okay? Um, or you could go for an ICS, which a steroid and Montelukast, and there's only a few children that would need both of those together. If they're still not getting control with that, then they need a referral to a pediatric respiratory physician or a pediatrician, depending on your area, whether you have access to a pediatric respiratory physician, because that's when you're looking at add-on specialised treatment for children. All right, so what is good control and what is poor control? If you ask an adult uh, asthma patient, they think they're well controlled when they use a blue puffer twice a day, which isn't well controlled at all. So good control in a child is daytime symptoms um, approximately twice a week, um, lasting only a few minutes and relieved by their bronchodilator, their Ventolin. Um, no limitation in activity, so they can run around with the rest of the children, no problem at all. Um, they don't wake up during the night ways in a coffin or first thing in the morning, and they need their blue puffer less than twice a week. The partial control is daytime symptoms um, greater than twice a week, lasting only a few minutes, but rapidly uh, relieved by um, the bronchodilator. If they have any limitations in activity, so say they can run for a minute, but if they run too much, they get, they get wheezy and have to sit down. That would be partial control. Any symptoms during the night or when they wake up or they need their blue puffer more than twice a week. So poor control would be daytime symptoms more than twice a week. I'm just going to minimize this. Um, lasting from minutes to hours uh, or recurring. So they'll have some Ventolin and they need it again two hours later. 
um, and it's only partially or um, it's not fully relieved by their um, bronchodilator. And if they have more than three features of partial control within the same week, then they've got poor control. So, um, you know, they've got limitations of activities. They're waking up during the night, first thing in the morning. They're needing a blue puffer more than twice a week. Then that's poor control. So reasons why we've got poor control. It's usually related to um, medications, not being able to use their, tech, their, their um, device properly. So maybe mum's decided not to use the spacer and just squirt it in their mouth, or they aren't very good at sucking it in, or they're on a preventer and they're not actually using it. A lot of um, mums will stop their preventer um, and only start it when they get sick. And it takes about two or three weeks to actually work properly. So it's a bit of kind of wasted time. Um, if you only use it when you're very sick. If they've got like uncontrolled allergies, say hay fevers, driving them bonkers and um, uh, they might need them sorting out before you would get per, uh, good control of their asthma. If they've got a lot of trigger exposure, um, they go into the grannies with the cat all the time or mum and dad are smoking in the house all the time, um, then you're going to struggle to get good asthma control. Um, if mum and dad don't understand what asthma is and they don't understand why you take the medications, um, they're more likely to stop them um, once the symptoms resolve. So a lot of education is required with the mum and dad and, um, and with the child, obviously, as well. If they don't have an asthma action plan or a regular review, you're more likely to get poor control because things just start to lax when you're not keeping an eye on it. Um, if it's not asthma, then you're not going to get good control with asthma medications. So there's alternative diagnosis. There's a um, graph here. I'm not going to read them all out, but uh, things like uni unilateral wheeze. So you've only got wheeze in one area. Um, that might suggest that that child has inhaled a foreign body rather than, so they've been playing with a bead and inhaled that right into one of the lungs. Um, that's pretty obvious. Um, what else have we got that's uh, wet cough, um, might be bronchiectasis or chronic bronchitis or an immune problem, ciliary uh, dyskinesis. So there's lots of different things that might look like asthma when you, when you look at it, but that it's not asthma. So when you're doing an asthma review in children, um, a general guide every three to six months when the asthma asthma is stable and well controlled more frequently if it's not. Um, two weeks prior to them going back to school is a good time to um, have a um, review of their asthma just to make sure that they are using their preventer and they know what they're doing and they know what to do when they get sick and they've got um, their reliever and they've got rescue medication at home like ready pred if need be. If they have any medication changes, so say you've started them on an inhaled corticosteroid, uh, you want to see them within four to six weeks to make sure it's um, working. Uh, if you've um, stopped their inhaled corticosteroid because you think they don't need it anymore, you still would need to see them within four to six weeks. If they've been in hospital, you want to see them within a couple of days and then get, and then again about four weeks later. There's um, two validated questionnaires for children, one for the under fives, which is called TRAC, um, Test for Respiratory and Asthma Control in Kids. Um, you can just Google it and find it. And Childhood Asthma Control Test, uh, CACT, and that's for the four to 11 year olds. And that'll give you an idea of how much it's uh, affecting their lives. When you've got the patient in for an asthma review, you need to have a think about or um, assess the recent asthma symptoms. So in the last month, have they had any symptoms at all? When are they getting symptoms? Is it during the night, first thing in the morning? Um, is it relieved by their Ventolin? Um, and assess if they've got any risk factors for future, future adverse events. So if they've had previous life-threatening asthma and ended up in the hospital in the ICU, um, your treatment might be slightly different. If you can, perform spirometry in children over six. Obviously, we've got the COVID restrictions, which we'll go through after. 
um, make sure that they're using the treatment that you gave them. Um, a lot of patients will tell you they're using the treatment when they're not, but you can just word it differently, say, um, uh, you know, occasionally you'll, I forget my inhaler or I forget my medication. How often would you forget to give the child their whatever preventer it is? Um, and usually you can get them to answer correctly. The other way you can do that is um, find out if they've been getting scripts elsewhere, um, what chemists they use, and you can see how often they're getting their scripts dispensed. Always check their inhaler technique because you'd be surprised how you taught them really well in the beginning and somebody else told them something different. So they have changed and stopped using the spacer or uh, they're doing something wild and wacky. Um, make sure the written action plan is up to date. So it does need to be updated as things change and it should really be reassessed every year. Um, have a look at the modifiable environmental factors. So your mum and dad smoking. Um, I love the mums and dads that say, well, it's okay, I don't smoke indoors and they've got a two-year-old, so they smoke outside, but the kid will follow them and they're sitting next to the mum and dad having a cigarette. <laughs> so it really doesn't make any difference. But um, you can keep trying getting the mum and dad to stop smoking. Because smoking outdoors with a child of two, it doesn't, doesn't make any difference whatsoever. The child will follow them. Um, treat any comorbidities. So we're talking in, in children, it's usually rhinitis. Um, and make sure that the um, parents, uh, uh, if they have any concerns about the treatment. So a lot of um, parents will be worried about giving their child um, inhale corticosteroids. They think um, there's lots of side effects where, where there really isn't. Um, and if you sit down with them and explain that if, every time they end up really sick and it end up on ready pred, that's the big dose of steroid. Um, that's more of a side effect um, than the inhaled steroid tiny dose that they can get have every day. Um, there's less risk with that. Cost is another issue because obviously some of these inhalers are like $41 a month, which um, can be cost prohibitive. Um, so we did have one question up there. Am I right, Bertha? Yep. Let me just um, open that up. So uh, if a young child between one and two years of age is present presents with wheeze and WOB. Lack of breathing. <laughs> yep. And responded to Ventolin, is it more likely um, asthma rather than viral induced wheeze? Um, it could be either or. Um, you would need to see if they do it regularly. And as I said before, look at their history. Has a mum and dad got asthma? Have they got eczema? Have they got rhinitis? More likely to be asthma. Whereas if it's just when they catch a virus, it might just be a viral induced wheeze. Great, thank you. I think that's the only question for now. If you do have any questions, please type them into the Q&A um, box and we'll um, get to them soon. Thank you. So this is a very busy slide. This is the asthma and COPD medications um, slide with all the medications on there. The National Asthma Council have come out with. Um, it will need to be updated very shortly because another couple come out. Uh, the last couple of years we've had mammoth amount of inhalers, haven't we? So our annuity, that's new. Um, Vitalis Sonda, that's new. Uh, Cipla inhalers, they're the new serotide, the generic serotide. Duress, Viramax, all sorts of new things coming out. And there's another couple on the way and I can't remember their names, I'm sorry. Um, triple therapy for adults and asthma. Uh, all right, so what is meant by a low dose of inhaled corticosteroid in, that, uh, in children? Just think of like, uh, if you've got Panadol and Ibuprofen, Panadol's 500 milligrams. Uh, so you take one gram four times a day and that's a normal dose, but Ibuprofen's only 200 milligrams and you take two of them. So 400 milligrams three times a day. So you can't compare apples with pears. So all the drugs have slightly different um, micrograms that you're having a look at. So um, QVAR, which is beclomethazone, 
um, 100 to 200 micrograms is considered a low dose and uh, over 200 micrograms and up to 400 micrograms is considered a high dose. Whereas um, the new one, fluticasone burate, or our new Elipta, 50 micrograms is a low dose and over 50 is a high dose. So they really don't, um, they don't match each other. You can't look at um, Palmacore and compare it with um, our new Elipta and think it's, you know, uh, 400 micrograms of our new at a high dose, but it's, it's over 50 micrograms, so they don't match. So devices for young children. So under two, definitely need a small volume spacer with a mask. Around about a two-year-old, if they can manage to suck a straw, as I said, you can take the spacer, the, the mask off the spacer. Um, we don't tend to use the big spacers anymore, even with adults. So the MDI and spacer, they're talking about the big volumatic. Do you remember those big footballs? We don't tend to use them with anybody anymore. So, um, but two to four year olds, possible they could use it, but it's a large volume that they've got to suck in. Um, so dry powder devices, we're talking about our nuity, um, turbo inhalers, that kind of thing. Five to seven year old, maybe. Um, over eight definitely could pop, you know teach them how to use that breath actuated devices i'm going to go back a slide um if i can oh i've gone too far so your breath actuated devices i'm trying to find one Aramar auto healer um the, the reliever and you've got a qvr auto healer they are the breath actuated so when you shake it lift the lid the little lever on the lid, you suck in, it actually fires that at you. You really won't want to give it to a child under eight, that's for sure. They'll just um, suck enough to fire it in their mouth and that's all. So action plans. Um, every child needs an action plan. You need one for school um, or daycare if you've got asthma. Um, and it improves outcomes. They miss less uh, school if they didn't have an action plan. They, they miss a lot less school if they've got one. Um, they wake up less at night and have improved symptom scores. So those two scores that I, I showed you earlier on. Um, and they help the parents recognise worsening asthma, increased symptoms, wheeze, cough, breathlessness, especially waking from sleep. And it will give every individual child an adjusting um, medication order. So it might be if they're only very mildly asthmatic, increase in Ventolin and only see the doctor and start the ready pred if it's um, getting worse. Or it might be if the children are, um, their asthma puts them in hospital every time they might start the ready pred as the um, asthma starts to worsen rather than waiting and it gives a um, when to call an ambulance. ICS do you recommend in each age group? So, um, <laughs> as I said, under under one, you shouldn't really have anybody on an ICS. Um, one at five, you're talking flexitide, the junior one path twice a day. Um, over six, you can have slightly more two paths twice a day or um, add in the singular instead. Uh, right, what else have we got? Um, can low dose ICS and singular you, uh, use long term, be used long term as a combination yes. in children? Yes. Okay. Um, singulars, you just got to be aware that singular can cause, um, uh, how do I put it? In adults, mm. it can cause psychosis. So in children, you just got to be very wary that if it's causing any problems with them, their behavior starting to go off, then you need to stop it. It is mm. quite rare, but it does happen. If you have a child that will not tolerate a face mask or a spacer, how effective is a nebulizer, nebulized Ventolin saline combination near the face? All right, you're talking about for acute, um, an acute setting or at home? Um, yeah, I would just do your best. Um, some medication is bound to get in, isn't it? Um, have done it before, just take the mask off and just fire it under the mouth. Um, obviously, it's better if they have the mask on, but the child going absolutely apeshit and screaming and um, they're not going to be breathing properly either. So that's not good. 
All right, what have we got next? If a child gets severe and viral induced wheeze a couple of times in autumn and winter each year with requiring ready pred, um, uh, is there a role for a preventer seasonally? As I said, um, if it happens every four to six weeks, we can give them um, a preventer. But yeah, you might want to do a preventer just in autumn and winter and then stop it in summer and spring. Um, yes, I have done that before. Uh, should we always use oxygen for nebulized vent and is our ear okay? We're going to get to that when we get to the acute setting. Ear's fine if it's just um, uh, a child who's not very well, but not really, really sick. And the uh, SATs we'll get to when we do the, the acute asthma part. How do we manage a child with persistent dry cough with no wheeze or shortness of breath? Is it asthma? You might want to refer that one on to a paediatrician because um, usually in children you would have the wheeze and um, feeling like their chest tight so they might say that something's sitting on their chest they don't tend to just have a dry cough just on its own it can happen but it's very rare should we always use all right we've done that one in the asthma plan, if only Ventolin, did you add ICS steroid, normal dose, higher dose? Uh, in the asthma plan, if only on Ventolin, if they're only on Ventolin, you wouldn't add in a um, steroid inhaler for when they're getting sick. Um, you would have an uh, increase in Ventolin and see your GP because they might just need ready bread. Um, because the ICS steroid, it takes about three weeks to get in your system, so probably not worth starting. Unless they're getting them regularly, as I said before. Hope that answered that one. It, do you double your ICS? We used to, didn't we? Um, no, <laughs> is the answer. As I said, it takes too long to get working. Okay. I think we've added, answered them all. We so, acute asthma in children. So what symptoms or what would you see when they come in? Um, they might have rapid shallow breathing. Um, so they're not going to tell you the short breath because they don't know what that means. Uh, you might hear them wheezy, um, cough, um, particularly at night and first thing in the morning, or if they get excited or um, start running around. I know my little boy, when he was like six months old, he would um, crawl around in circles and then get really tired and wheezy. Um, using accessory muscles, so seeing that tracheal tug, so this bit here, sucking in, the ribs retracting, um, using their tummy muscles to breathe. They get quite pale, um, lethargic, and they can be quite irritable. I know my son was white as a sheet every time he got really bad. So what are you going to do when they come into the practice and um, they're having asthma? I'm um, going to do a primary assessment, so just check them over. Um, is it mild or moderate um, asthma or is it severe or life-threatening? So that will um, guide what treatment you're going to give them. Going to check their pulse oximetry, um, give them bronchodilators, do a secondary assessment, um, follow-up management, and when you're going to see them again. So primary assessment in mild to moderate, they can walk or crawl around and they're not really bothered by that. Um, they can speak in whole sentences and, and if it's a very young child, they're babbling away, no problem at all. And their oxygen sats are, you know, 94 and over. If it's severe, um, using any accessory muscles, um, they've got the ribs sucking in, tricky old tug, tug, their tummy um, muscles are getting used. They're unable to complete a sentence in one breath just due to the shortness of breath. They look distressed and their oxygen sats are low 90 to 94 and that'll be severe. Life threatening is when they start to get reduced consciousness or they collapse. They're exhausted, they're blue, um, they're not putting in much effort. You can't hear many breath sounds going down and their sats are 90%. That's not what you want to find in primary care, is it? So mild to moderate management. Um, Ventolin, one to five year old ch children give two to six puffs. So six puffs would be equivalent of one um, 2.5 microgram um, Ventolin nebulizer. And in children six to 12, you can give up to 12, uh, 12 puffs in one go. So four to 12 puffs. You repeat every 20 to 30 minutes for the first hour. 
um, or sooner if needed. Monitor and maintain their oxygen saturation, so we want it at least 95%. Um, and monitor them for the first three hours. Um, if they don't get any response, you call an ambulance. I always want to say 999. I'm 40 years of dialing 999. It's quite hard to change to 000. Um, continue giving the Ventolin until the ambulance arrives. Nebulize Ventolin or Subutamol only if the patient's are unable to breathe through a spacer. When you give it through a spacer, you get smaller particles. It gets further down in your airways than the nebulizer where you can see the big, big particles and they're not getting as far down in your um, airways. And try and consider um, starting the oral steroids within the first hour. So the first thing you want to do is give them Ventolin, but the next thing you want to do is give them some steroids. So for life-threatening um, episode, oxygen-driven Ventolin via continuous nebulization. So remember when we said uh, life-threatening episode, they're um, very lethargic and not putting much effort into breathe. So giving them a puffer and spacer is not going to work. So um, for a one to five year old, you give two um, 2.5 nebules, uh, over six to five milligram nebules, sorry. Um, and monitor and maintain their stats and you need to keep it above 95%. You wanna get uh, an emergency ambulance there as soon as you can. If you're having poor response to Ventolin, you can add in uh, epitropium bromide, which is Atrovent. And if there's no improvement or they're getting worse, they can have IV magnesium sulfate added. Um, if they start to improve, you can consider changing them back to the Ventolin um, via this puffer and spacer or start um, weaning down the, the nebulizer times to every 20 minutes. This is very, very busy, but this is in the guidelines and it's just basically what we've said before. So immediately you're going to assess and start the bronchodilators within minutes, reassess their severity, continue the bronchodilators, add IV magnesium if they're not improving. Um, and then within the first hour, start the systemic corticosteroids, so you're ready, Fred. Um, and then reassess again, see if they need to go to hospital um, if they're deteriorating, it gives you the guidelines for uh, how much Ventolin you need to give for a nebulizer. So it's a good one to print off and pop on your wall of your treatment room. So when you've had a flare up that's that bad, then you really need to be seen within a couple of days again. Um, and then a comprehensive assessment just to see what's been happening uh, within a couple of weeks. So. Um, you might not go through all the triggers at two days. You're just checking to make sure they're still using the Redopred. They know how much Ventolin they can have, when to phone an ambulance. Um, whereas at two weeks, you want to be looking at what happened in that exacerbation. Why did it happen? What triggered it? Um, you're going to have a look at their medication regime. Are they needing the preventer and are they using, if they are actually on it, are they using it properly twice a day, every day? Did they have their reliever available or was it out of date or empty? Check the inhaler technique again. Um, make sure they've got a written asthma action plan that's up to date. Um, they know self-management and action plan use. They know what to do. Um, if they're old enough and uh, able to um, use spirometry. Do you notice we didn't do that, the spirometry, when they're having an acute attack? Because that would be cruel. Uh, review and modify the treatment plan as necessary. So we might need to um, look at what treatments are on and whether it's appropriate for them. Now, people get confused with community first aid protocol and an asthma action plan. So I might write on an asthma action plan if they're unwell, give 12 puffs every 20 minutes, phone an ambulance um, if they're not improving. Whereas community first aid is what we'd use in the community as a first aider if you come across somebody with having asthma um, while you're waiting for the ambulance. So it's not the same as an individualized um, asthma action plan. But the community first aid protocol would be if somebody's having um, an asthma exacerbation in front of you, um, sit them upright, give four separate puffs of um, 
their short acting beta agonist or um, bronchodilator like Pentolin by a spacer. If you don't have a spacer, make a spacer. Use a newspaper rolled up or whatever you can manage. They use one press of their Pentolin four breaths in and out. So each puff, four breaths. Wait four minutes. So it's all the four, so you remember. So four puffs, four breaths per puff, four minutes. If they're not any better, you repeat that step one to three. So give four puffs, four breaths with each puff, wait four minutes. If they're still not improved, still wheezy, they're still short of breath, can't speak in a sentence, you phone an ambulance and keep going till the ambulance arrives. Four puffs, four minutes, four puffs, four minutes. If you don't have a watch or a clock that you can monitor it, don't worry about the four minutes, just wait a few minutes, then go again. But most people have a mobile phone that's got a watch on it, a clock on it, sorry. So these um, first aid um, posters can be printed off and put in um, in your treatment rooms or if you're with sporting clubs um, up on the wall there. Um, they can also be used um, just by um, first aiders out in the community. So COVID-19, that's um, caused a lot, little bit of an issue with um, asthma because um, as soon as they phone up and say a child's got a cough, um, they're sent for a COVID swab. Um, so uh, it's quite difficult to assess them over the phone. Um, so generally speaking, they're gonna end up in ED. Um, so check everyone's got a written action plan so that they don't need to be um, getting sick while COVID's on. Um, less people are getting flu and things, but as I said, we've got an outbreak of RSV and about two months ago, we had an outbreak of rhinovirus. So um, it, these things can cause asthma to flare up. If you're performing spirometry in general practice, you need to um, follow the TSANZ recommendation. So you need the inline filter. Um, and be wiping everything down afterwards. Infection controls, um, you've got to be high on your agenda. Um, if you think they've got a viral illness and you don't know what it is, you shouldn't be doing spirometry. Um, continue their current asthma medication, including their inhaled corticosteroid, um, using steroids for severe flare-ups as indicated. Um, if avoid using nebulizers, especially in general practice, um, use a puffer and spacer is much better. Um, when you use a nebulizer, you're making everything aerosol and you're actually pushing it out into the air. So you're going to give whatever that patient's got to the people in that um, vicinity. No sharing of medications or spacers, even between family members and always have um, reliever medication handy at home. There was an issue last year when uh, a lot of people didn't, who didn't have asthma went and bought all the Ventolin and there was none left for the actual asthma patients. I think that's settled down now. There's a lot of resources um, you can get available online. So the Asthma Handbook that I spoke to you about, that's the website for that. National Asthma Council have a lot of videos that we use. Um, it shows people uh, how to use their puffers. Um, brochures that you can order and charts that you can order online. Um, sensitivechoices.com, they have some con consumer um, information as well that you can get. So this just acknowledged um, the people that wrote this presentation. So questions, let's see, I think that was, you would only use um, the nebulized Ventolin um, with um, children who are in severe life-threatening asthma. Okay. Um, oh, waiting. Thank you, Rona, for taking the time to present tonight, and and thank you everybody for attending. Yeah, if, one more. <laughs> if we don't want to use a nasal steroid for allergic rhinitis, what alternatives work? We use a lot of um, flow and um, fess um, nasal washout, not the little spray, the, the big bottle um, that um, washes out the sinuses, gets rid of anything that's any bits of pollen or cat saliva or whatever that's in there sinuses and the airway up here, the nasal airway, um, that works, or an antihistamine. So I would use the flow and an antihistamine, that would be my first option. I think that was the last question. So thank you very much for everybody attending. Thank you, Rona. Oh, one more question. One more, was it? <laughs> uh, 
some kids need ICS and nasal sp spray. Yes, the doses add up. So just keep them to a low dose um, ICS if possible. Um, but it's better than them being on ready pred every other week. But yes, it definitely adds up. So if you have a nasal spray, um, inhaled steroid and an a inhaler ICS, the doses com combine. All good. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Rona. Have a great evening and see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Beth.